energy seminar. And uh, this week, uh, we are happy to have uh, two speaker. And the first is Guido, uh, Guido Rizaliti. And uh, Guido is a professor of astrophysics at the University of Florence, Italy. And uh, previously, he has been a researcher at the IIF Observatory in Italy. And he was also a research associate at the CFA here from tw uh, 2002 to 2014, so 12 years. And uh, his main scientific interests are the multivalence emission of the quasar and its physical interpretation and the connection between the physics of quasar and cosmology. So today, uh, Guido will tell us about uh, the high, high shift quasars building a new standard uh, candle. So Guido, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And hello, everybody. It's a real pleasure to talk to you. Unfortunately, not in person. I wish I will come there as soon as possible because it's kind of my second home. And uh, so uh, today uh, I will present you the latest results of a multi-year project uh, aimed at uh, uh, building a new standard candles uh, out of high redshift quasars. And, uh, uh, so um, uh, this is uh, um, uh, something which already had uh, some, uh, uh, we had already some significant results uh, uh, published. And uh, today I will focus more on the method. So on what we can do to validate this new method to, you know, to, to measure distances with quasars. So uh, to start with something that is for sure is known by, by all of you, uh, the two main uh, um, central um, uh, kind of emissions in quasars are from the accretion disk and from uh, uh, an X-ray corona, which is a word to say a cloud of hot, or hot electrons of unknown geometry, uh, which for sure is anyway very close to, to the black hole. And uh, this uh, uh, corona is emitting X-rays, uh, uh, while the accretion disk is mostly emitting in, uh, in the optical UV. And uh, uh, that's, that, that, that's obvious. And uh, what we uh, know observationally is that uh, despite uh, a large uh, you know, um, amount of observational properties, uh, due to the interaction of the quasar with the inter circumnuclear medium and on the com of the complexity of the quasar itself, uh, there are there is uh, I mean we, we observe uh, uh, I mean many different properties, but on average on average uh, the emission of quasars seems to be quite constant with redshift and luminosity. And here you can see the typical power law in X rays and uh, an optical spectrum of uh, uh, a very high redshift quasar uh, with superimposed uh, uh, a template ob obtained from uh, the average of uh, of the stack of low redshift quasars. So basically, it's, it, you, you see no, no evolution here. What instead is being found, which is uh, not uh, clear, is that there is a relation between the X-ray emission and the and the disk emission, which can be described by this uh, log linear law between, uh, I mean, usually we use the 2 kV monochromatic luminosity and the 2500 angstrom UV luminosity, and for um, historical reasons. Um, and uh, we, we see that uh, there is uh, a relation between these two uh, quantities, which is nonlinear in the sense that in the log-log form, this relation is, uh, uh, this coefficient is not one. I hope you can see my mouse. Um, uh, and it is uh, around 0.6. And uh, we, we did a lot of work in the past years. Uh, at first, there were just a few hundred objects with very different observational uh, um, data. We, we made, uh, we built a homogeneous sample and, uh, um, and uh, um, we, which is a based on more than 15,000 quasars uh, with both UV and X-ray spectra. And we selected uh, a, sam a good sample for, uh, for cosmology, let's say, of about 2,400 uh, um, quasars. And so it's a big uh, cut. And uh, one 
you know, fundamental point is uh, to be sure that this selection didn't introduce any bias. And this is one of the, my main uh, subjects uh, today. And uh, um, uh, so here you see one plot that we published in a paper a few years ago, where you see this relation. And this is in units of luminosity. So this is the, lumin the X-ray luminosity and the UV luminosity. So in this form, you cannot do cosmology with this relation simply because we are already using luminosities. And so we are assuming a cosmology, okay? However, it's obvious that if we replace luminosities with fluxes here, from this relation, distances will not cancel out because this coefficient is not one. And so one can derive a distance as a function of X-ray and UV fluxes, okay? And that's the, you know, the, the, the idea of the method. And uh, here I go straight to, to the end in a sense, because this is a Hubble diagram that we built with uh, uh, our sample of quasars. And uh, I mean, the individual points are quasars, don't care about the, the different colors they, because there are different subsamples. The, the important thing is that, uh, I mean, the, the red, the, the big, uh, sorry, the big black points are averages in redshift beams. And despite the big dispersion, which I will comment in a few minutes, um, the uh, statistics is enough uh, to, you know, to have a significant, significant constraints on cosmology. And in particular, we, we demonstrated that this uh, uh, Hubble diagram uh, suggests uh, a, a, a tension with the Lambda CDM model, which is very significant statistically. Here, very briefly, is uh, um, yeah, I am showing a couple of plots from a, a couple of papers we recently published. And uh, uh, here in the top uh, uh, plots, I'm showing a cosmographic analysis of the Hubble diagram uh, with the comparison with the Lambda CDM. And, where we show that uh, in a non-parametric way, uh, the, the lambda CDM is in model is in more than four sigma tension with, with our data. And in the bottom panels there, uh, we, we show um, the constraints on possible extensions of, uh, of the um, lambda CDM mo uh, models, some like the CPL model, which is a, a model where the dark energy component is evolving with redshift. So, all, all these uh, here, um, I, I'm showing these results just to say that from a statistical point of view, these data uh, are already uh, powerful enough to put strong constraints on, uh, um, on, uh, on cosmology and also to obtain some unexpected results, which are, uh, you know, um, uh, quite relevant. I mean, if we could trust uh, these results uh, completely, it would be a little revolution in cosmology. So the point is whether uh, this uh, uh, result is uh, reliable. And this is what I'm, I will focus on in the, in the remaining of my talk. And so if uh, you want to, uh, some, let's say, play uh, Davis advocate, one could ask many important questions to, to, to you know, regarding the, uh, how reliable is this method, uh, considering that uh, the dispersion is very high and that we, uh, we made a very strong selection. Actually, uh, the selection was done only based on the quality of the observations. So mostly uh, X-ray observations, which are deep enough to obtain uh, a good spectral uh, uh, information. And also um, the, um, we, we made selections in terms of X-ray spectra slope. We chose uh, standard quasars with a power law with the standard slope of an unabsorbed quasar. And the same, we selected blue, um, blue uh, optical UV colors. So let's say it is a selection of standard blue X-ray normal quasars with good quality observations. But are we introducing any biases? Are the quasars in the cosmological sample, as I write, uh, typical quasars, or are we selecting what uh, we, we like? I mean, we, we don't like, we don't know that, but I mean, something which could introduce a fake redshift uh, dependence. And even more, more important is, uh, is the X-ray to UV relation constant with redshift? Um, and are there systematic effects in the flux measurements? Did we 
did we measure the fluxes right? Now, regarding the first question, let, let me just spend one minute or something like a philosophical point. Every time we want to check uh, um, uh, a new standard candle, um, we, we can, you know, check uh, if we did uh, everything mm, pro in the proper way in terms of observations and in selection. But uh, um, regarding the physical point, so is uh, this uh, really a standard candle? Well, we cannot have a direct observational check, okay? Never. Any uh, check of the sample based on statistical arguments uh, on uh, uh, comparisons with uh, uh, cosmological models are something that uh, are at the very least are model dependent. But the only way uh, to, um, to trust a new standard candle is to think that physically, it, we have a good reason to think that the physical relief phenomenon that we are using to, 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 uh, to calibrate that standard candle is correct. Just to give an example, we all use uh, cephate stars as standard candles because we are convinced that there is no good reason to think that uh, cephate stars in uh, Andromeda galaxies are any different from uh, those in our own galaxy. But there is no, no observational way to, to demonstrate this, okay? So it, the, the, we have to check whether this is plausible. Of course, for separate stars, we are all convinced that this is the case because we understand well the physics of separate stars, and the same is more or less true with supernovae. And instead, with quasars, since we do not understand the energy transfer mechanism between disk and corona, uh, actually, we do not have a, a solid physics ground for this, this relation. And so we have to. To, to see what we can do without this uh, you know, physical understanding. So there is a lot that we can do anyway. And uh, uh, this is a list of checks that uh, an improvement that can be done to, to, to check the, the, the hypothesis of, uh, uh, you know, of quasars as uh, standard candles. And uh, so I'll go through all of these uh, briefly. And the first one is obvious, is the comparison with supernovae in the common redshift interval. So how does uh, the Hubble diagram of quasars co uh, compare uh, with, with that of supernovae? And as you see here, the, the match is nearly perfect. The, the blue points are supernovae, the yellow points are quasars. So you can see how worse uh, is uh, the, the precision with quasars, but the red points are the averages of quasars in small redshift beams. And so you see that there is enough, uh, uh, well, actually in the common redshift beam, you do not add much to, to, to the statistics because supernovae are uh, uh, carry much more information, but you can see here that uh, the, uh, the match is perfect. I mean, the absolute calibration uh, is uh, done using supernovae. So there is no surprise that uh, they, they match well, but the shape of, of, the, of, of, the, of this curve, of this Hubble diagram, we do not have any control on the shape. So it, the, the shape match because, matches because I think, uh, you know, uh, quasars are, are reliable. So the point is whether they keep being reliable at the higher regions, okay? So we cannot check the world relation, but part of it can be checked. And uh, the method is very simple because we have enough statistics to, to check the relation in small redshift beams. And if we do so in small redshift, in, in, in small redshift beams, basically the distances of all, all the quasars are the same in each subsample. And so we can fit fluxes versus X-ray fluxes versus UV fluxes as proxy of luminosities. And we can in this way, um, check that the slope of the relation does not evolve. And this is shown here, you see on the top panel, the slope of the relation in different redshift beams and in the bottom, the dispersion, um, the intrinsic dispersion of the relation. And basically you, you, you see that there is no evolution in, in, in the slope. And this is cosmology independent because you are just using fluxes. And uh, then uh, we can, and this is the, the big part of uh, uh, our work in the past uh, two, three years, 
uh, do a detailed spectral analysis of all the sources in our sample. Uh, all the first part of the project have been, has been done based on photometric data. Now we did a complete spectral analysis of, of all the SDSS spectra, and we are doing the same also for the X-ray spectra. And uh, so these are just examples of, uh, just to show you that for each spectrum, we did a complete spectral analysis with several, uh, with the continuum and the line components. Uh, so it's been a quite uh, detailed uh, work. And uh, um, uh, so we can use this, uh, uh, this spectra, for example, to check one point, which is one of the, uh, the most worrying ones which is the possibility of a dust reddening, which would uh, uh, make uh, the uh, UV flux measurements unreliable. And so here we did this exercise, which is the following. This is again the same Hubble diagram in, uh, with different colors. And uh, the, um, well, the colored stars are the averages of the actual points, while uh, the, uh, the dashed line is the lambda CDM model. And basically, we calculated how much reddening do we need in each redshift red bin to, shi to um, shift, to, to put the, the, uh, the real uh, colored stars on, on, the, on the lambda CDM curve. So to, to move up by you know, this quantity here. How much redshift? So if we made the, the, the um, measurement uh, in, a, in a wrong way, because we didn't correct for the reddening, how much reddening do we need? And maybe it's a bit small here, so let me zoom the three uh, final lines. So you see that for the three IRH points where most of the deviation is, uh, you see that you need an E B minus V of about 0.1. And at, at first I was a bit scared by this because I said, oh my God, I mean, my point one is not a, such a big reddening. And so maybe we, we made such a mistake. Actually, no, because in, in the UV, it's not a small value of reddening. And here you can see an exercise that we did starting from our average uh, um, stack spectrum, which is the, the one, uh, the, the highest one in this plot. We, we, we are uh, added uh, to, 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 the, uh, to this uh, stacked spectrum. We, 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 uh, we added different levels of reddening as shown in this uh, caption down to uh, point 0.1. So point 0.1, which is what we need, is the bottom spectrum. And you see that the difference is huge. I mean, it's completely impossible that we, we, we missed such, uh, uh, by, by, uh, such a huge redshift, uh, uh, sorry, reddening, reddening effect. Even because um, one, um, I mean, unless indeed in our, in our sample, there is such uh, a big spectral difference uh, among the different pins. In order to check this, we, uh, we did uh, um, uh, a spectral analysis of stacked spectra, and basically we divided our parameter space in many uh, different uh, subregions. Here you see, for example, uh, a volumetric luminosity versus black hole mass uh, plot, and the colors are redshift beans. The blues are the highest redshift, the red are the lowest redshift. And so, and these are just part of the parameters. Basically, we made stacks primarily uh, based on redshift, but also on other uh, spectral or physical properties. And the result that we got is that in all cases, all these stack spectra are always basically the same. Here I'm just showing the, the, the full um, stacked spectrum. And uh, superimposed to that uh, as a black line, there is also the Vandenberg uh, uh, template based uh, on uh, the first uh, Sloan sample made of uh, several thousand quasars. And uh, you, you see that uh, there is no uh, difference between the two templates. And actually each uh, stacked spectrum that uh, we built uh, uh, from here and in particular uh, in different redshift bins is exactly uh, you know, the same as this one. And so, it cannot have such a, a huge uh, reddening effect inside. 
So I think we ruled out any significant uh, contribution of, uh, of reddening. And we also demonstrated that there is no spectral evolution of, uh, in the average, uh, uh, spectral properties of our sample up to the highest ranges. And uh, regarding, the, regarding the, the dispersion, the intrinsic dispersion, this is the final part. How can I go on for four more minutes? Do I have time? I think so. Um, so I'll go on. I cannot hear any. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Oh, it's yeah. okay. Thank it's you. Minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Good. Uh, okay. So the, the, the final part is regarding the dispersion. So I think that uh, we 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 convinced ourselves, and I hope I've convinced you that uh, there is no uh, bias related to uh, flux uh, problems in flux measurements or in or in sample selections. Uh, our quasars are pretty average in, in the same in all redshift bins. Uh, however, wh why is uh, uh, do we find such a, uh, a large dispersion? And when I mean a large dispersion, uh, not just in absolute sense, but also uh, with respect to the statistical errors on the measurements. So there is a, a large intrinsic dispersion in, in our uh, Hubble diagram. Well, actually, uh, we, we think that most of this dispersion is due to uh, uh, still due to uh, measurements that are not biased in a particular way, but uh, are less precise than uh, their statistical error would suggest, uh, probably because of mainly of calibration uncertainties in, in the, in the X-rays. And here I'm showing uh, a plot which we recently published on a subsample, a small subsample, just 30 objects at high redshift, redshift three, about redshift three, with particularly high quality uh, X-ray observations. And we did uh, a complete spectral analysis, both in the X-rays and in the UV for each of them, one by one. And uh, what, uh, what we found is that uh, they, they stay on the same relation. Again, it's a flux-flux relation because they are all at the same redshift and with the same slope again, but the dispersion now is much lower. The intrinsic dispersion is below 0.1 dex, which is not far from that of supernovae at redshift uh, higher than one. So uh, if we could have this kind of uh, quality uh, for the whole sample, it will be not much worse than, 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 than supernovae in terms of uh, precision. So this is uh, quite reassuring. And regarding Again, the remaining dispersion, there is something very interesting that we, we can see, which is the following. We, we know that there must be some remaining external effects that we haven't removed. For external, I mean that they are not due to the physics of the, of the this corona connection, but they are due to some uh, observational uh, problem. The first one is the X-ray variability. Well, variability in general, I say X-ray because in, in the X-rays we expect it to be uh, higher than, than, than in the UV. Um, and then the inclination of accretion disk, assuming that instead the um, X-ray emission is uh, isotropic. And uh, uh, there is not much that you can do uh, to remove these uh, uh, two effects. For the variability, because even if we had uh, simultaneous observations, the light crossing time from the disk to the corona is probably longer than the, uh, uh, the length of an observation. And so we wouldn't have physically simultaneous states anyway. And uh, for the inclination, there are uh, some inclination indicators, but none is uh, uh, reliable uh, with, with, with enough precision. And, uh, but what we can do is to estimate the contribution of these uh, two effects to the to the uh, dispersion that we have. And regarding variability, this is a very simple exercise. For several hundred sources in our sample, we have more than one X-ray observation. So we basically compare the fluxes between the first and the second longest observations, just two in most cases, but in case there are more than two, the, the, the two longest observations. And we, we saw that there is a dispersion in addition to the statistical error, of course, an intrinsic dispersion of about 0.1 dex. 
And we also checked uh, if there is a difference with redshift or luminosity, and it is about the same in all the subsamples. Regarding the inclination of the accretion disk, uh, this is something that we should, should be uh, treated carefully because we cannot expect that our sample is uh, randomly oriented. Just because since it is a, a flux selected sample, the, the, the original SDSS one, uh, so we expect that uh, because of the flux limit, uh, objects close to a John are removed more easily from, from, from the sample, uh, given even the steepness of, of the luminosity function. And so we made uh, simulations to, to predict exactly the distribution of inclination of our observed sources and to, uh, and to estimate uh, the effect in the dispersion of the relation that we obtain. And here is basically uh, what we expect, uh, assuming um, the, 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 okay, the uh, red uh, uh, line is the relation that we would have with all face on objects. And this is the, the, uh, the observed, uh, the, the, well, the, the predicted one. And, the, um, and if we fit this relation, we obtain, uh, first of all, a dispersion which is higher than that we observe in the, our best samples, and also with a strong non Gaussian effect. And both of, of these are not observed. And I think that uh, this is an, an indication that probably this is the indication that there is a torus. Uh, and so uh, our uh, uh, quasars, the ones that we classify as broad line quasars, are truncated in terms of, of viewing angle. And indeed, we saw that uh, since most of the effects is done is due to this tail, if we, all, um, if we assume a torus of only 15, 20 degrees, uh, it's enough to cut uh, most of this, uh, um, of this dispersion and to remove the non Gaussian effect and uh, to uh, put the dispersion below the observed limit. Anyway, you see, I'm discussing about the opposite problem. So assuming that the X-ray emission is isotropic and instead the UV emission is disk-like, we have a, we expect more dispersion than we than we observe, and then this has to be added to the variability effect. So our conclusion is that basically there is no intrinsic dispersion, or very little intrinsic dispersion, and so uh, even if uh, um, you know there are still. Uh, uh, not satisfactory points in this uh, uh, project because there is no physical model to explain uh, this nonlinear relation. And the dispersion on average is still higher than that of supernovae. There are good reasons to believe that uh, uh, quasars are reliable as standard candles uh, because the slope is not evolving with redshift uh, because of the constant spectral properties. And uh, as I've shown you, uh, because we, I think that beyond the cosmological application, we are proving something which is uh, maybe as important as the cosmological application. And, and, and what we are proving is that this relation appears to be universal and with no intrinsic dispersion, which means that this still unknown mechanism of energy transfer between disk and corona for some self-regulation is the same for all quasars. And so it is pointing to you know, a universal physical property of quasars, which uh, uh, I hope uh, we will be able to understand soon from a theoretical uh, point of view. And uh, I think I can stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guido. Uh, I think we have time for one quick question. Uh, do we have a question from our in-person attendees? Sure. Oh, nice uh, sorry, could you yeah. use the... Um, what about then incorporating new star spectra to get a better handle on the effects of how much contribution there is from the current x rays point to that, obviously. Have you included that in any of these samples? Uh, okay, yes, I, I repeat just to be sure I, I understood the question is about the new star spectra, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so uh, we, we tried for a, for a few, uh, for a subsample of a few tens of objects, 
uh, indeed uh, adding new star uh, um, adds uh, uh, in constraints and, and it confirms, uh, you know, what, what we find with XMM or Chandra alone. Unfortunately, the flux limit of new star observations are typically uh, not enough to, to do this, uh, to, to match with our, with the, um, with the UV spectra from SDSS. So the, the X-ray emission of our objects, it's typical, typically in the flux range of some 10 to the minus 14 in the two to 10 kV range, and which means that uh, most of them are too faint for new star. Thank you, Guido. Uh, I think uh, we can move to the next speaker, but if you have further question, please uh, sign on the Google sheet and talk with uh, Guido on Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so let me introduce the second speaker while we... So the second speaker, I the pleasure to introduce is Navin Schrider. Uh, he's a PhD penultimate uh, year candidate at Columbia University. His research spans various aspects of uh, high energy astrophysics and multi-messenger signals from binary stars. For example, accretion around compact objects, emission mechanism of high energy non-thermal X-rays from black or uh, corona, and the physics of particle heating and acceleration in uh, various astrophysical plasmas and also the origin of coherent radio emission from sources like uh, pulses or uh, fast radio bursts. Um, it's interesting, it does both uh, kinetic plasma simulations, the peak ones, uh, also hydrodynamic tool simulations and also pen and paper modeling. Uh, and also by the, uh, also directly observing astronomical sources via satellite and uh, ground-based telescopes. Uh, thanks for being with us today, Nain. the floor is yours. Thank you so much. The, the title of the today's presentation is Persistent Neutrino. Sorry. Uh, let's see. Oh, perfect. Persistent Neutrino counterparts to past radio bursts. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, I think we can. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, great. So we're talking about uh, the potential for observing persistent neutrino counterparts from fast radio bursts. Um, uh, here's a quick primer on what fast radio bursts are. I'm sure you all are familiar with it. Uh, these are the these are the millisecond duration uh, uh, intense radio pulses that have been observed from outside of our galaxy for the past a decade. And this is a, this is an example of fast radio bursts. It has all these substructures, and uh, so they they some of the FRBs are repeaters, some are non-repeaters. Their luminosity spans are uh, decayed in energy, in, in, in uh, uh, luminosity, and their brightness temperature is extremely large, 10 to the 35, 10 to the 36, even 10 to the 838 or uh, Kelvin, which uh, requires a coherent radio, uh, coherent emission mechanism, like a laser, for example. And uh, their polarization properties are all over the place. It can have all the way from zero degrees to 100 degrees, 100% uh, 100 linear polarization. Uh, some are also seen to exhibit circular polarization, some not, and a same source exhibits both linear 100% and 80% circular polarization. It's a mess. Uh, some FRBs uh, are also seen to uh, uh, have uh, persistent radio counterparts to them. So these FRBs are millisecond duration flashes, but uh, there's also a spatially coincident persistent radio source 
which is extremely bright, brighter than supernova remnants, brighter than the local star forming um, activity and so on. Um, and that's some of their rates. That's one of one a couple of FRBs. Uh, the repeating ones have also been known to exhibit periodicity in their emission. I'll uh, talk about that also very soon. Recently, CHIME, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, uh, which is the uh, workhorse of FRB discovery, uh, put out this uh, FRB catalog, which showed uh, a very distinct dichotomy between uh, repeaters and non-repeaters in terms of their spectral temporal width. The one-off events, the non-repeating uh, uh, population of FRBs, are uh, typically uh, wider in their bandwidth and they are shorter in their widths time temporally and the repeated ones are usually uh, wider in duration uh, they can span up to a few tens of millisecond but their bandwidth spectral bandwidth is short it's gaussian like uh, this is an example of the non uh, non repeater versus repeater dynamic power spectrum uh, up in y axis your frequency x axis is time I can clearly see uh, the difference that I'm talking about. You can find all these drifting frequency substructures uh, in repeaters. It's also nicknamed sad trombone. Bam, bam, bam. Um, so this, we know that magnetars can emit FRBs. We have seen that from our galactic uh, magnetar SGR 1935 plus 2154. But these uh, observations suggest that they're there needs to be more than one population, one engine for FRBs, something that we have also learned from GRBs, right? So perhaps the, there's another uh, non magnetar based engine. This is not just the only observational uh, um, hint for that. <clears throat> FRB 1809-16 was found at, a, at 250 parsec away from the nearest star forming region. Uh, and uh, FRB 20O and 20E was found uh, to be localized to a globular cluster, which is indicative of uh, an older stellar population. A young magnetar uh, is often invoked to be explaining um, the FRBs, and these young magnetars would not be found to be young uh, at uh, 250 parsec away from its birth site. They would be extremely old. And globular clusters are not exactly the places where you can find young magnetars either. So this is also indicative of a different population for uh, FRB engines, something typical of older high mass X-ray binaries, uh, black hole powered by black hole or neutron stars accreting from uh, companion. Based on this, uh, motivated by this, we uh, developed this model for uh, uh, an FRB uh, emitted from uh, accreting engine. So um, for example, like a micro blazar where the uh, jet of the uh, accreting solar mass black hole, for example, say it's pointed along your line of sight, and the flares that are emitted from the base of the jet, as you can see here in the animation from SS433, if it is along, if it's if it is directed along your line of sight, uh, the shocks that are produced are the reconnection even the magnetic reconnection events that will be caused along the striped jet can produce FRB-like uh, signatures. And uh, uh, when there is a misalignment, these just can persist, for example, due to uh, lens steering precision. And uh, the time scale associated with the lens steering precision as the, FR, uh, as the jet beam uh, persists away from your line of sight would correspond to the periodicity that is observed from a couple of uh, uh, FRB sources. Like I said before, uh, there, ha there are also uh, uh, persistent radio counterparts seen from FRBs. That is uh, an example from FRB 121102. Its luminosity is extremely large, uh, 20 to 39 Earth per second, uh, which is more luminous than supernova remnants, local star formation activity. And interestingly, this source also exhibits a very large Faraday rotation measure. Uh, of the order of 10 to the 5 radians per meter square, which is usually seen from region that is close to, for example, uh, 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 Sagittarius star or extremely uh, polluted environments. 
this requires the persistent nebula that is causing this radio source to also be baryon rich. Baryon rich. It cannot just be electron positron plasma to have such a large rotation measure. So is this an oddity? Um, not really. Recently, we observed another FRB source with very similar properties in terms of FRB luminosity, in terms of the rotation measure, in terms of its uh, prolific FRB emitting uh, nature. And this also exhibited uh, a persistent radio source around it. Uh, and these persistent radio sources are compact, are about a parsec in size. And uh, that's what we think is, uh, is giving rise to the large rotation measure to the pulses, to the FRB pulses traversing through this nebula. So what could be producing these uh, persistent radio sources? We still uh, do not understand it very well. We have seen these nice bubbles, these nebulae around ultraluminous X-ray sources. Uh, that's the one around NGC 7793. And uh, this is the one around SS433, the galactic uh, ULEX uh, uh, source, the Manatee Nebula. It's called the Manatee Nebula because it resembles the Florida Manatee. <laughs> Um, and we know that these bubbles are inflated by uh, hyperaddington accretion events that, is, that are happening uh, in the in the core of these uh, bubbles. The the uh, elongation is primarily due to the uh, uh, due to the uh, outflow along the jet axis, more powerful, fast outflow along the jet axis, and uh, the width here is primarily believed to be due to, due to uh, slower um, equatorial disk winds. So motivated by these bubbles, uh, we just scale things up to, uh, to come up with an object called a hypernebula. So these hypernebulae are uh, objects that are, uh, are the bubbles that are inflated by hyperaddington accretion events. And not not the ones that are that are seen from ULX like cases, even extreme than that, uh, thousands to ten thousands or even hundreds of thousands of uh, Eddington uh, uh, rates accretion. And you can expect such large accretion rates to happen prior to, for example, common envelope like events when the entire envelope of a star is in an unstable fashion dumped onto a companion compact object. That's when you can expect such large uh, accretion rates. And most of the material that is dumped onto the compact object will be uh, uh, will be uh, uh, will will not really enter the compact object, but rather will be thrown out as outflows, which will interact with the circumstellar medium uh, and then uh, uh, produce various shocks and uh, can accelerate particles. And these accelerated electrons can uh, produce various emissions. That's that's what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. So uh, what we do is we evolve the uh, particles, the electrons, and the field energy distributions um, of uh, the, the electrons within the nebula, uh, accounting for various uh, cooling losses. Uh, before going on to that, this is just this just this cyan curve just uh, shows how the size of the nebula changes with respect to its expansion uh, time scale. And it just saturates at around one parsec. It's it's a compact uh, subparsec scale, extremely energetic uh, nebula. So the this plot shows the time evolution of the electron distribution, taking into account all the uh, co cooling losses, Bremsstrahlung, adiabatic, inverse Compton, and synchrotron losses. And once you have a time varying electron distribution within the nebula, you can calculate the observables, uh, the spectra, the light curves, and the rotation and dispersion measures. Uh, the, the, the spectra is shown here for, uh, for an example case um, at uh, three different time scales, and it peaks somewhere between a few gigahertz to uh, millimeter uh, wavelengths. At different times, and that's the light curve. This is the dispersion and rotation measures. Uh, the dispersion measure and the rotation measure is caused due to the um, ejecta coming from the accretion disk winds, 
and that's uh, that changes uh, with time. So once we have all these observables, we can go and try to explain uh, the observed uh, properties of the persistent radio source from FRBs. Uh, the dotted, sorry, the, the black circle and the red diamonds here uh, show the um, uh, spectra of persistent radio source from these two FRBs and uh, for certain combination of uh, the parameters for the expanding hypernebula, you can very nicely explain uh, the uh, observed persistent radio synchrotron spectra. <clears throat> and in addition to that, you can also very nicely explain self consist in self-consistent consistent manner the time evolving uh, rotation measure that is seen from uh, uh, the FRB source. So it's a self-consistent concordant model to explain the FRB luminosity, the persistent radio sources, uh, and also the change in the rotation measures, uh, dispersion measure values. <clears throat> and these um, hypernebulae uh, could also be discovered regardless of FRBs. Like I said before, it's only when the jet is oriented along your line of sight that you would see an FRB in this model. But you can also have a scenario where the jet is orthogonal to your line of sight, but you will still see the persistent radio source. Uh, so uh, we did some calculations with uh, the sensitivity of VLA and found that about 10,000 such hypernebulae will already be there in the current VLAS uh, all-sky radio survey. And about 10 of them, so just to give you a perspective, there are a million plus sources in VLAS and most of them are AGM, right? So. 10 of these sources can be found as transient sources, transient hypernebulae. Um, how would you detect them as transients? You just compare the first uh, radio survey that was taken in the 1990s, and then compare it to VLAS over a time scale of 20 years, you could see some sources to change, uh, to exhibit a change in their luminosity by a factor of two to three, uh, either increasing or decreasing. These are mostly either young hypernebulae or the oldest hypernebulae. So this is where uh, I'll be uh, making another jump and trying to connect another uh, problem in uh, energy astrophysics with FRB, XRBs, and now neutrinos. Um, Ice Cube and the Baikal um, uh, ice, uh, neutrino telescopes, they have established uh, 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 diffuse high energy neutrino flux, extra galactic uh, neutrino flux. And uh, okay, yeah, you can see them as these uh, uh, green and gray and uh, pink dots in these figures. And the known transients like uh, supernovae, GRBs, uh, fast blue optical transients, uh, uh, time, uh, tidal disruption events, these can supply up to around 1% of this high energy diffuse neutrino flux between 1 TeV and 1 PeV. So where's the rest of the flux coming from? We know that the uh, recent NGC 1068 uh, Seyfert Starburst Galaxy produces 1% of the flux, and then a Blazar T excess some phone number, I forgot. It also produces 1% of the flux. That's all we have right now. We are still missing so many astrophysical sources uh, that can supply this flux. Um, the jet termination shock of the hypernebulae can accelerate protons uh, to extremely higher energies, energies, depending on, of course, the Hilas criterion. And these protons can interact with the uh, thermal and non-thermal photons from the accretion disk coronae that are beamed because of extremely large uh, uh, accretion rates. And um, they can engage in photomesonic reactions. You have protons and photons gamma going through a delta resonance can produce neutral pions and charged pions. The neutral pions decay to form gamma rays and the charged pions decay to form neutrinos. Uh, and uh, 
the curves here that you see, uh, solid lines, solid curves, brown, purple, blue, are the model uh, neutrino spectra or the neutrino flux obtained from hypernebulae accreting at different Eddington uh, ratios, 1,000, 10,000, and so on, uh, prior to common envelope-like events. And as you can see, they can very nicely explain uh, a good fraction of the uh, observed high energy neutrino flux, even the entirety of it. But uh, if you take conservative estimates by um, taking an average of accretion rate accretion rates over uh, over integrating over volume, at least twenty five percent of the uh, high energy neutrino flux can be explained by these uh, hypernebulae that can that are seen prior to, that one can expect prior to common envelope like events. Um, in addition to that, one of the requirements of the sources of the diffuse high energy background neutrino flux is that they have to be gamma ray faint. Like uh, uh, recall that I uh, the neutral pions decay to form gamma rays. So through photomesonic reactions, the gamma ray flux uh, that you get would be comparable to the neutrino flux. But the gamma ray flux that we actually see uh, from Fermi integrated gamma ray background constraints is much smaller than uh, the uh, neutrino flux. So that suggests that most of the background neutrino flux sources should be gamma ray faint. And that's the check we run here. Um, in, within the hypernebula, the disk photons will interact with the gamma ray photons that are produced through photomesonic reactions through bright Wheeler interactions, and then they pair produce. So most of the gamma ray photons are also attenuated within the uh, hypernebula and they don't really escape, thus rendering hypernebula to be gamma ray faint, which also satisfies the uh, Fermi constraints. So can a persistent neutrino counterpart be observed from an individual FRB source? The honest answer is it's going to be challenging, but uh, if you if we find an FRB source within a few megaparsec uh, with a persistent radio con radio source uh, whose luminosity is comparable to the previous examples 121102 and so on, then one could detect a persistent neutrino counterpart from that engine uh, with a 10 year integration time with the future ice cube Gen 2 observatory. Um, yeah, uh, I think I'll uh, just wrap it up now. Uh, these hypernebulae uh, can be expected to form uh, right before common envelope-like events due to runaway rapid mass transfer. Um, and these accreting engines can consistently explain uh, the properties of a subpopulation of FRBs, if not all, and their associated persistent radio sources. They presage energetic transients from common envelope mergers like uh, luminous red novae, fast blue optical transients, and can act as signposts to future uh, LISA events. They can potentially explain a good fraction of the observed diffuse extragalactic high energy uh, neutrino flux. And uh, hypernebulae are plentiful in our universe. They are perhaps even lurking in our uh, all sky radio survey samples like VLAS, and they're just waiting to be discovered. Um, I'll stop here and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any question from the uh, person, people? Okay, let me ask one. In, in this plot where you're showing uh, the trajectory of the nebula and showing that uh, the radius costs to a certain Asymptotic value mm -hmm. the less than a parsec. Mm -hmm. So there was also a curve for the energetic particles. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay, so this number of particles. Yeah. Uh, do you mean the energetic ones, the, the energetic electrons, or what do you mean here? Um, so here I just mean all the electrons that are injected into the um, uh, into the shock. So, so it's just a up material upstream. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So. Um, 
Uh, it, it just stops at T active. That that just signifies that uh, there's no more accretion happening. So there's no more uh, matter that's being pumped into the um, into the uh, nebula because mm -hmm. uh, the matter is pretty much uh, all accreted into the mm -hmm. compact object. Mm -hmm. So no more winds happening. If you wanted to plot here something representing how many energetic particles are there as a function of time, uh, uh, given the speed you have, is, is it something which one could calculate just by the envelope, or uh, is it a bit, it's complicated? No, we actually have the spectra, uh, the distribution of the particles. So you can, you can just choose which part of the uh, distribution that you are interested in. For example, if you are interested in which particles contribute to the rotation measure or the dispersion measure, the, the, if you want to know what the fraction of the cold particles is that contributes to the DM, you can just get it from the from the distribution measure, mm -hmm. uh, distribution curves. The same goes with the high energy particles. Um, yeah, it's not a big, it's not, it's not complicated. You can do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can uh, you can tell how the the synchrotron spectrum. I think it was plotted later. Yeah, how the synchrotron spectrum will change with time. Absolutely, uh, exactly. That's what uh, we do here. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Any other question? Yeah. This was um book model. Do you think you're able to somewhat explain the variation in the observed Sorry, variation. The the, the variation in polarization. Uh, you mean in FR FRBs? Yeah, sorry. Uh, no. Um, so that that your question uh, leads to the emission mechanism, and uh, here is a slide on that. One of the emission mechanisms that we invoke here is called a synchrotron maser. Right, so that's when you have a magnetized perpendicular shock, and uh, and in the momentum space, the particles acquire a circular, uh, unstable metal structure. They collapse and they emit uh, coherent radio emission, and this is usually highly linearly polarized. Uh, but you also have circular polarization from some sources, and one one or two sources show both circular and linear polarization within a matter of few seconds. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's not just one emission mechanism. Perhaps you're also you can also have reconnection happening, um, uh, and the plasmoids merge, and that can give rise to different polarization signatures. Uh, there could be multiple emission mechanisms. That's my guess. Other questions from person? Yeah. Okay, let's thank our speakers for today again. Thank you. Let's see you next week. Thank you.